rare disease descends upon a New England city. Children are its prey. I knew the chances were very high that she could die. Doctors battle this unrelenting killer as it rapidly consumes their patients' bodies. Unfortunately, children die within hours, no matter what you do. They must find the source of this scourge as an outbreak threatens the unsuspecting children of an entire city. Massachusetts, 2 a.m., March 3rd, 2000. Look. Look right into this. Dr. Michelle Harris was treating a young girl with puzzling symptoms. Okay. Here? She had a temperature of 105, so it was really quite high. She didn't have a real easy, identifiable source for her infection in the blood. She just basically had a high fever and felt kind of weak. Then Dr. Harris noticed something unusual. She had a real small, almost like a pencil point size red dot on her shoulder on this size that the parent hadn't noticed. Because she had such a high fever and this little dot of a rash, I decided to, to do some blood work um, to look for you know infection in the blood. Dr. Harris started the girl on antibiotics, but would have to wait for the test results to determine what was making her sick. Within minutes, another patient with similar symptoms arrived. 11-year-old Kayla St. Pierre was rushed to Lawrence General Hospital's emergency room by her parents. Triage nurse Rick Westhaver was concerned by her strange and troubling symptoms. I noticed that she had a purplish rash all over her, and she didn't look very well. She was very lethargic. She was limp, slumped over, not really saying much. I asked a couple of questions, looked her in the eye. She didn't repeat anything to me. She just kind of looked up and kept saying, Daddy, it hurts, Daddy, it hurts. Westhaver rushed to find the doctor. The triage nurse came back, Ricky, um, and he looked a little concerned and said, have, have you ever seen anybody with a real high fever and purple blotches all over? And my heart just, you know, stopped and uh, I said, are you serious? Dr. Harris knew Kayla was in trouble and that her life was in jeopardy. She looked very weak, incredibly pale. She already had various sized like purple blotches all over her skin. Dr. Harris recognized the blotches as puperic lesions, which are caused by blood vessels exploding under the skin. The purple rash was a symptom of a life-threatening problem that was more than skin deep. There's organs that aren't getting enough blood because you're losing it to other spots. Whatever's causing that rash is also causing major problems with those organs. Whatever was attacking Kayla was trying to kill her by targeting her major organs and cutting off circulation to her extremities. Her legs were cold to the touch and barely had a pulse. To Dr. Harris, Kayla's symptoms suggested a rare and deadly disease called meningococcal meningitis. The potential killer infects the fluid lining around the brain, making it swell, possibly causing serious brain damage. The disease intensifies its attack when it gets into the bloodstream and causes a runaway infection throughout the body, a condition known as sepsis. To determine how far this deadly infection had spread, Dr. Harris performed a spinal tap. The fluid that came out was very cloudy. You know, it should look like tap water, it should be clear. So as soon as it came out, it was quite obvious that she did have meningitis. You know, meningitis is, is a very scary, horrible disease. You could tell by her appearance, her lethargy, by her abnormal vital signs, she didn't just have meningitis. She, she was 
septic. I mean, she had germs everywhere. So our job then was to resuscitate her as aggressively as possible. But she was definitely in a critical spot right away. By the time she came in, things had gone pretty far. One of the most dangerous traits of meningitis is that it can advance from cold and flu-like symptoms to a life-threatening situation in just a few hours. Dr. Harris asked Kayla's parents to describe the onset of their daughter's symptoms. Just 18 hours earlier, Kayla had a slight fever, but she insisted on going to school. Throughout the day, Kayla continued to feel worse. When I came home from school, I saw her on the couch. She was kind of just sitting there watching cartoons, but there wasn't anything unusual about how it seemed. She just seemed like she was had a cold or the flu or something. But this was no oh. cold. In a matter of hours, Kayla was fighting for her life. When Kayla woke up that night, she had already had spots on her. It was very hard for her to walk and very hard for her to breathe. She let my parents know, and they took her to the hospital immediately. Dr. Harris was upfront about Kayla's condition and the grim prognosis. Your daughter is suffering from this. I don't think it is fair to not let families know right from the beginning everything you're thinking. I did tell them that I thought she had an overwhelming sepsis and meningitis, that also she had this abnormal blood, you know, bleeding going on and, and clotting in various places, and that she probably had, you know, close to a 50% chance of actually dying from this. At Lawrence General, there was only so much Dr. Harris could do to save Kayla's life. Because Kayla was so sick, she needed the highest level observation and care. We don't have a pediatric ICU here at Lawrence General. There are several good children's pediatric ICUs in Boston. Children's Hospital is one of the best. But transporting Kayla was risky. In her weakened condition, the doctors weren't certain she would survive the journey. She was intubated with a breathing tube. She was on several IV antibiotics. She was getting blood um, vasopressors to bring up her blood pressure. As Kayla's family watched her transfer to the ambulance, they feared they might never see her alive again. When we got there, they were wheeling Kayla out from one room to the ambulance, and we saw her, and she was covered in purple and blue spots, and it was the most horrible thing I had ever seen in my life. It was very traumatizing. With Kayla on her way to Boston, Dr. Harris rushed back to the patient she saw a half hour before Kayla arrived. Hey, Jessica, how are you feeling? Earlier, the young girl had only a tiny purple like spot on her right shoulder. How are you feeling? Now, the terrifying symptoms were developing. As I looked at her now, there were a few more scattered little spots. And after seeing Kayla, you know, the, the light bulb went on that this was, you know, uh, very potentially another um, child with meningitis. Dr. Harris called in the girl's pediatrician, Dr. Lilia Guerra, who was troubled by the girl's vital signs. Her blood pressure was also on the low end of normal. So I was very concerned at that point that the meningococcemia was progressing and that also she may be having a reaction to the antibiotic, uh, which would be causing her blood pressure to drop and her heart rate to start to increase. No relief. Doctors knew meningococcal disease was rare, with only 75 cases per year in Massachusetts and 2,600 per year nationally. Two cases at the same hospital on the same night could be no coincidence. There was such a concern this may be an outbreak. Is to have two children come in within several hours of each other was very unusual, and it was 
pretty obvious there was likely a common source and what we needed to do is, is figure out where that was. The public health community was alerted. This, of course, was alarming to everyone. One case of this disease makes everybody nervous and two in one day is a lot. As Kayla St. Pierre was en route to Children's Hospital in Boston, her doctor's worst fears were realized. Kayla was deteriorating fast. Her blood pressure and her vital signs were plummeting. When the ambulance pulled up, she was rushed into the intensive care unit. She had two major problems. One was shock, which means inadequate blood pressure and blood flow to her organs and her extremities, her hands and feet. And her other major problem was her lungs were becoming very sick. The bacteria invaded her body and released a toxin. And then the body reacted to this toxin. And her entire blood clotting system went awry and started clotting on itself. Her body was literally attacking itself. Blood clots were blocking blood flow to Kalo's hands and feet. Meningitis is extremely deadly in children and was quickly killing Kayla. Doctors feared they were running out of time. Unfortunately, a proportion of children die within six to eight hours, no matter what you do. And we haven't been able in healthcare to make much advance on that population of children that dies despite therapy. It's unclear why they there's nothing that can be done. You do everything you can to support their blood pressure, to support their um, respiratory status. And we we're very worried with Kayla that that might happen because she was very, very sick. She looked very close to death. They said she wasn't, probably wasn't gonna make it and we were just in shock. We didn't understand how something that didn't seem like anything at all, like a small cold, could just escalate so far and so bad. If there was a common source of this potential killer, other children were probably already exposed to it. There was no telling how many more young children were carrying and spreading the ticking time bomb of meningitis. In Lawrence, Massachusetts, meningitis, an invisible killer, was lurking somewhere in the city, preying on young girls. It had already attacked two girls who were now fighting for their lives. Doctors feared this indiscriminate killer had already infected other kids with seemingly harmless cold-like symptoms that would turn deadly in an instant. They all could end up like Kayla in a matter of hours. We were very concerned that other children in the community were at risk and our main goal was to protect the children in the community to make sure that it didn't spread any further. To prevent a potential outbreak, they had to find the source. Desperate to find some common element that might point them to the killer, doctors spoke with the infected girl's parents. They learned both girls attended the same school. It's a very scary reaction, actually, um, thinking that you know this young lady was at school, um, interacting with other children, um, and you, you just you think about how how many people that she may have infected, and what's going to happen. Before school started, doctors called the superintendent of the school district to let them know the potential danger to their students. The physician from the emergency room at uh, the hospital uh, told me I had two children who had meningitis and that one would probably not live through the day. The principal was now looking at a possible outbreak and 550 of her students were less than an hour from starting their school day, any number of whom could be carrying meningitis. 
Or perhaps the potential killer was lurking undetected somewhere in the school. School officials look to doctors for specific information on how the killer disease spreads. Meningococcemia is caused by a special bacteria that is carried in the nose in about 5 to 10 percent of people who don't have any symptoms. But we don't know why, but certain people get very sick with it. The one in 10 of us who carry the bacteria but are unaffected by it are called silent carriers. We wish that we knew why some people are affected by this disease so severely and others um, have a mild disease and other people carry this organism in their nose and never get inf infected with it. The deadly bacteria are transferred from silent carriers through a sneeze, a cough, or saliva. It can survive for only a few minutes outside the body. But a few minutes is plenty of time for the microscopic killer to strike when kids share a candy bar, a can of soda, or even something as innocent as a tube of lip gloss. With meningitis present, any of these activities could be fatal. At the school, the principal took every precaution. The bathrooms were cleaned and the water fountains turned off in the event the killer bacteria was somehow being transferred there. As school officials waited for their students to arrive, the second girl struck down by meningitis was getting worse. Seeing her with an increased heart rate and a lowish blood pressure, I was concerned that given that she looked like she had meningococcemia with this fever and this petechial rash on her skin, yeah. that this could progress. Dr. Guerra was becoming desperate. She had to do something. I felt that she would be safer in an institution where if she needed intensive care, monitoring, uh, more uh, cardiovascular support or respiratory support, we needed to have her someplace where there was an intensivist and an intensive care unit available. The young girl was medevaced to Boston Children's Hospital as her classmates arrived at school. We needed to know if any of our children, you know, were in contact with the children that were ill, we needed to notify the parents and um, we needed to notify the teachers. They all had to be together and that the best thing would be to keep the school open. The sooner they identified the kids who were carrying meningitis, the less likely they were to end up like Kayla St. Pierre who, despite the doctor's best efforts, seemed to be losing her battle against the disease. She had to be on renal support. Her kidneys shut down. Her hands and feet were purple, and it was progressing all the way up to her knees, and we couldn't get any pulses. And people have tried different treatments to open up that blood flow, including anticoagulants, all kinds of things, and nothing's ever been effective in this disease so far. Kayla's condition was critical. The young girl was in a battle for her life. We were very worried that Kayla wasn't going to pull through because we were having significant difficulty maintaining her blood pressure and maintaining her oxygenation. The doctor said she probably wouldn't make it, that we should be prepared for her to die, that um, the chances were very slim that she would live. As Kayla lay near death, doctors and health officials knew that if they didn't find the source of this illness fast, the deadly bacteria would continue to attack more innocent children. In Boston, Massachusetts, Kayla St. Pierre was fighting for her life as the deadly meningitis bacteria was ravaging her body. A second young girl also hovered near death. Unable to care for her any longer in the small town of Lawrence, Massachusetts, she was medevaced to Boston Children's Hospital. Both girls attended the city's Hennessy School, but they were in different grades. 
health officials were desperate to protect the children. They feared something in the school might be the source of the invisible killer. But they had no idea what it was. The questions they were asking were, when the children ate lunch, did grade one go to lunch with grade three? My answer was no, that each grade level went to lunch alone. The next thing they wanted to know was out in the recess yard. Were they cross-graded? The answer again was no. The two girls were never together. There was no obvious common source where they came in contact with each other. But there were plenty of places the girls could have passed the deadly bacteria on to their classmates, friends, and family. We tried to track the children and do a map of where these kids were all day to try to identify contacts. We also needed attendance to see how many kids were out that day, and we made phone calls to every single parent to find out why kids were not in school, just in case there were more than two cases. Health officials worried about children who were home with cold or flu symptoms. They feared they might be facing an outbreak that was raging out of control, and there was nothing they could do to stop it. The first few days were the most critical, because if we were going to prevent it, we needed to get people the medicine really fast. Anybody who was suspected of having been exposed to the two victims needed to begin a regimen of antibiotics immediately. They hoped the antibiotics would kill any possible meningitis bacteria that might be hiding in their systems. But the treatment was no guarantee. Some people can be perfectly healthy their whole life and then get meningococcemia and die within 12 hours despite the fact that they came to the healthcare system and were getting treatment. Out of the school's 550 students, the health officials determined 82 children plus seven staff members could have had contact with the infected girls. They called those specific parents to come in immediately, as soon as they could, so that they could take the children to their family doctor. We started thinking about what we were going to do. We knew we had to uh, organize a response. We had to figure out how to tell people to come and get medicine. We had to figure out how to get them the medicine. Uh, we had to make sure the pharmacies had the medicine. Students who weren't exposed to the infected girls were sent home with notices about the crisis. The note told parents their child needed no treatment. Many parents were confused by the letters or justifiably very concerned still that they weren't really sure that their child hadn't been in contact with one of these girls. Oh yeah, this is Peter Ashton. Ashton's or telephones in the building never stopped ringing. It was either the parents or a call from the media. We had hundreds, both in the emergency room and at our health centers, requesting treatment or requesting some type of examination to determine whether or not their child had actually been exposed to meningococcemia. Healthcare officials ran out of antibiotics, their only weapon against the killer bacteria. They had to replenish their supplies. We managed to get the state stockpile of rifampin driven up to Lawrence, and the pharmacies had been able over the weekend to start getting supplies of the rifampin and the, the ciprofloxacin that we needed. Parents were terrified the deadly bacteria was hiding somewhere in the school and was already attacking their children. Sunday morning in Lawrence General's ER, two days after the first victims arrived. Tragedy struck again. A third sick girl was brought in. It was a memorable arrival. There are lots of ways of people arriving in the ER, but this is one of those cases where everybody was on high alert from the moment they saw her. Uh, the father was carrying this girl 
in his arms, and she was limp, hanging over his arms, and obviously not very responsive at all. She was covered in a purple rash. From the moment Dr. John Gorey saw her, he knew she was in desperate need of help. One of those things where you thought, this child may be going to die on us. She wasn't responding in any way. The very obvious thing, when I, as soon as I looked at her, was this rash. Dr. Gorey feared meningitis. The sooner you can get the infection under control, uh, the more likely your brain is to survive and your body is to survive. The doctor performed a spinal tap as a test. Normally, you have three or four white cells in your spinal fluid. In the case of my patient, she had something like 10,000 white cells. I didn't even need you know, to know the laboratory results. We started her on two antibiotics and on a steroid. We had her intubated, and we were giving her fluids to maintain her pressure. As with the previous two meningitis patients, doctors rushed the third victim to Children's Hospital in Boston. Three children had been struck by the deadly meningitis outbreak, but there was something even more frightening about the most recent victim. I learned that uh, she didn't go to the same school as the other children. The revelation about the third girl meant the common source for the bacteria wasn't confined to the Hennessy School. No one knew where the killer came from and who it would attack next. It was a terrifying development for healthcare officials. So to receive that phone call on Sunday was like, oh my God, what's, what's happening, what's happening? Doctors had to find out where the common source was before even more kids started turning up in hospital emergency rooms on the brink of death. In Lawrence, Massachusetts, three young girls were struggling to survive as the deadly meningitis bacteria ravaged their bodies. Doctors and health officials feared they could not stop the killer before it claimed more victims. At Boston Children's Hospital, the most severely affected girl, Kayla St. Pierre, was fighting multiple complications from the disease. To consider repairing the damage to her limbs, the doctors brought in a nurse practitioner for plastic surgery. She could tell Kayla's prognosis wasn't good. My initial impression was there probably won't be any plastic surgery because she's not going to make it. For days, nurse Heather Loray kept a close watch on her. Each day that I went in, I was surprised to find that she was still with us. Morning after morning, I was surprised to see that she had made it through the night. This was a very sick little girl. Her extremities were purple. Um, she was on full ventilator support. And after a discussion with the several nurses who were nearby, um, I learned that she was on full blood pressure support, and it was clear to myself and the team that Kayla wouldn't live 24 to 48 hours. Kayla was a fighter. I mean, she had so many complications and so many things that this um, bacteria affected. The most dangerous complication was a lack of circulation to her hands and feet. We lost her pulses in her hands and feet, which is also something that happens with fulminant meningococcemia, and we couldn't detect any blood flow to her hands and her feet. Kayla's health care team discovered gangrene was setting in. If they couldn't restore circulation to Kayla's limbs, they would have to be amputated. While she was fighting for her life, we were um, at the same time waiting to see how much of her extremity she was going to lose. And it becomes clearer every day. This deadly disease was becoming health officials' worst nightmare. 
After days of work, all they had uncovered were more questions. Why was the killer attacking only young girls? Where could it be hiding? It did not seem to be contained to one location. But what did the victims have in common? By following the few clues left behind by the killer, officials learned the only place all three girls had visited was the local girls' club. The most critical part of this cluster was the kids who had been at the girls' club. They had been exposed first. Then, of course, as the girls who got sick went to class, they exposed other children. And so the next uh, group was really, of course, their families, but their schools. To determine if any other children were in danger, health officials had to learn how many girls had been to the club and who they had come in contact with. That included going through lists from the schools, going through social contacts, going through girls' club contacts to really come up with uh, everybody who could potentially be exposed. We wanted to cast a wide net. Officials were running out of time to find any other infected students. A child can have just symptoms of a cold at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and be near death's door by 10 o'clock at night in an emergency room. It, once, it, once it hits, uh, it moves very, very quickly. So any child with a temp of 99 or above, was, was parents were contacted to, to get that kid checked. They had to spread the word about their fears quickly. Friday we decided to go on television Sunday night and say, if your child was at the girls' club during this particular period of time, you really, really need to see your doctor and talk about getting preventive medication. Area hospitals were overwhelmed with people seeking antibiotics. This place was packed. I'd never seen anything like it. You know, anybody that had a child in the school system, anybody who had driven by a school in their car, um, Everyone was here wanting, you know, a shot or a pill to prevent meningitis. So we very quickly had to figure out how we were going to handle this amazing number of people. We treated people who we would call the worried well. We did many spinal taps at the hospital. We erred on the side of caution. And anybody who was sick got a really careful going over. If there was any question, we treated them. The media blitz reached other towns. In nearby Lowell, Massachusetts, Natasha Garcia was seriously ill. Her mother, Becky, feared for her daughter's life. There was purple spots going in her body. She had a real high fever, I think it was 104. She already was real weak, and, um, but they never knew what was going on. Be Doctors okay, believe she had Henoch Schonlein pupera, a disease with symptoms similar to meningitis, but were waiting to confirm the diagnosis. When the girl's mother heard one of the official bulletins, she became terrified the killer had struck again. Doctor, they were saying about three girls that had meningitis in Lawrence. That put me thinking, and I say, meningitis? I got scared. I told the doctor, I think she has meningitis because, um, there's a news going on in Lyons, and that's from the Girls and Boys Club, and that's where she goes. Doctors ran new tests and discovered Natasha, in fact, was infected. They hoped Natasha might hold the key to unlocking the source of this deadly disease. We were concerned that we were having so many children coming down with this same disease, one right after the other. In the course of four days, we had four cases of meningococcemia. News of the fourth meningitis victim ratcheted up the public's fears of an outbreak. Health officials could do little to calm them. Everybody was talking by this time. The television cameras were there, and the newspapers were there. Uh, and we did not have information about this fourth child. Was it part of this same group? Did it mean something different? One of the most important parts about public health work is staying calm. 
Panic never helps situations like this. Hospitals continued to struggle to keep up with the constant flow of children and their parents desperate for some sort of treatment. I remember constantly thinking about what else should we be doing? Have we missed something? Is there something else, somebody we haven't talked to, some other stone we haven't turned? Officials in Lawrence were powerless to stop the outbreak if they couldn't find the source. What could be making so many girls sick? Because all the young girls were hospitalized around the same time, officials believed they may have been infected at the same exposure. Something must have happened to give the killer an opportunity to infect so many girls at one time. Because it takes two weeks for the disease to take hold, officials believe the kids were exposed during a school vacation week. Many kids had been at the girls' club during school vacation week. There was a Head Start center that shared the same building. The kids in Head Start and the kids in the girls' club and boys' club often shared meals. Uh, because it was school vacation week, the kids went and played games at other schools. Hundreds of schools could contain infected children, meaning thousands of kids could be carrying and spreading the deadly virus. I worried that we hadn't reached everybody who needed the medicine. What if somebody had gotten exposed and somehow they hadn't heard about it and got it or gave it to someone else? I worried that there would be more cases, that there would be more cases than we could handle. While health officials worried about future cases, doctors were still concerned about the first patient. Kayla St. Pierre lay in a coma. The bacteria was attacking her body, shutting down her blood flow. She was fighting for her life. Unfortunately, there were areas what we call necrotic or mummified, where the tissue had died because of lack of blood flow, and then you need to remove that um, so that it doesn't become infected. Doctors were forced to amputate parts of all but two of Kayla's fingers. Her family and her doctors were all hoping this surgery would save her life. Health officials feared they were running out of time to find the source of this killer before more children like Kayla were overwhelmed by the disease. A week into a meningitis crisis in New England, doctors were trying to save Kayla St. Pierre's life. Gangrene had already taken most of her fingers. It was now ravaging her blackened legs. Doctors feared she was losing her battle against the disease. Despite the setback, Kayla continued to fight. I was just impressed with her ability to fight against all odds and survive. Even though she was in a coma, I would talk to her and explain to her what was going on and, you know, maybe describe the weather and, you know, just touch her like rub her head. The hospital staff hoped they could save as much of Kayla's feet and legs as possible. Kayla's sister, Bridget, knew how heartbreaking it would be for Kayla to lose them. Kayla was very active. She would swim, roller skate, ride her bike, go out with her friends. Um, she did everything. Very high spirited. While doctors tried to stop the devastating effects of the disease, health officials looked for the source. But that did show up in all the records. The officials believed the disease came from a single exposure. When we discussed this with the uh, Department of Public Health at the state level, they felt that instead of calling this an outbreak, they wanted to call this a cluster, since all of the children had essentially gotten sick at approximately the same time. So let's go back. For the health workers, it seemed impossible to believe they weren't dealing with an epidemic. Find out if all of the girls were Because most of us had never been through anything like this before, I have to trust them here because was this an epidemic or was this one case? And they kept telling us over and over again, this is one case, this is not an epidemic. And we had to keep repeating that 
and trying to convince ourselves as well as those that we were communicating with that indeed this was only one event. We could get the attendance records. Uh, now they had to find that one event. All of these kids got exposed at the same time. They all got sick at the same time. Somebody, you know, who was with them gave them all the disease at the same time. The investigators were puzzled. Something or someone was making the girls sick, but they seemed no closer to finding the mysterious source. The fourth girl who was struck down by the disease gave officials more data to work with. Two weeks prior to the girls' hospitalizations, three of the four were on a school bus together. They were on a girls' club-sponsored field trip. The killer must have struck at some time on that trip. We narrowed it down to a group of girls who had been on a bus. We found out from the kids that, you know, there was someone had lip gloss and they were passing it around. Officials believe they found the probable source. An ordinary tube of lip gloss. Health officials marveled over how something so simple could become so deadly. Because meningitis has a two-week incubation period, doctors would have to wait for two weeks to declare the crisis over. And only if no new victims were reported. We made a decision as a team that we were going to relax until we had gone two weeks without a new case. None of us knew what was going to happen next. For the next two weeks, I lived in terror of the phone ringing. We had a very intense two weeks of work. Um, and toward the end, people slowly started to feel easier as the 14-day period from the last case ended. Uh, but it was a very intense time. Their hunch was correct. The cluster was contained. There were no new meningitis cases. The killer had been stopped. The bacteria, it seemed, would claim no new victims. And three of the meningitis victims were making progress. Some went home within days. The other ones who came in really just had the rash, had minimal blood pressure symptoms that responded with just a little bit of fluid to help the blood pressure, and um, then got off the ventilator the next day, woke up after treatment, and were, were pretty much back to normal within a few days. There were no easy explanations for why the other victims recovered, while Kayla St. Pierre continued to suffer complications. People's bodies respond differently to illnesses. Some people's immune systems are more competent than others. A previous viral infection can sometimes have weakened you, you know, say if you have a viral infection, and on top of this you get a bacterial infection, you can have a much worse response. Kayla continued to face circulation problems. Doctors used an ultrasound machine to try to find a pulse in Kayla's legs. The, the machine uses sound waves to determine the extent of the dead tissue. You're waiting for what's called demarcation, which is when it becomes clear what tissue is dead and what tissue is alive. They could not find a pulse in her feet and the bottom of her legs. Doctors had wakened her from her medically induced coma. Nurse practitioner Larray gave the heartbreaking news to Kayla. I said, your legs are very sick, and they are also stopping you from healing the rest of your body, and they're going to make you sicker unless we take them off. And I told her that we're going to take your legs off to help your body heal. And um, Kayla cried, and she looked away. Kayla's legs were amputated just below her knees.
When the surgery was complete, the brave young girl found her fight was just beginning. When I woke up, I realized I didn't have my legs. For some reason, I knew that I didn't have them, but I just didn't know why. I was depressed, of course, really, and angry. I used to be able to walk and, you know, run and roll blade and stuff like that. And now I couldn't, I was stuck in this bed and I wanted to do stuff, but I couldn't. As Kayla recovered, she was transferred to Shriners Hospital in Boston to begin months of physical therapy. Kayla underwent over 50 operations in a three month time span. Um, and she certainly endured her share of pain. For the girl who endured so much physical pain, she was about to face the worst kind of emotional anguish. I was getting better, and my legs were healing, and my arms were healing, and I was doing really good. I was really excited about going home. And then my mom died, which was really hard for me. And my dad wouldn't be able to take care of me, so I knew I wasn't going to be living with them. And I didn't know where I was going to live. Kayla's nurse once again came to her aid. I was a wreck for Kayla because I thought that that was over the top for what she had been dealt. After I spoke to Bridget about what was going to happen to Kayla, when was she going to leave the hospital and where was she going to go, I thought long and hard about it and decided that surely she could come live with me. After all of Kayla's loss, she found a new family. One day, Bridget called me and we were talking and then she started talking about me living at Heather's house and I'm like, cool. So after we talked, I hung up the phone and I immediately went to the playroom and started telling everybody. The first time I took Kayla out of the hospital, she was like a freed prisoner. <laughs> She was all laughing and giggles and sing, singing to the radio and just hanging her head out the window, getting the breeze in her hair. Kayla's positive attitude has allowed her to live like any other young teenager. I'm proud of a lot of things physically. Writing was really hard. My writing has gotten really, really good. It's really good. I learned to ice skate and I ride my bike and I swim, and I can swim without wearing prosthetics, which is kind of hard. And I learned to snowboard and monoski. I've become very mature for my young age, which a lot of people tell me. I now respect things. Like if you chip your nail, you shouldn't complain about it, because you know, at least you have nails, it's, it's different. I only have two, but it's, it's tougher and I've learned to live with it. What makes Kayla amazing to me is that what her mother always said is really true, is that she is a feisty redhead and um, you just can't keep this girl down. Kayla's unrelenting spirit and the skills of her doctors allowed her to defeat a deadly bacteria that was intent on taking her life. Three days now. A meningitis outbreak that could have devastated a city was prevented thanks to the combined efforts of the Lawrence healthcare officials and the community. We could have had people hysterical and we didn't. People communicated and people listened. For the children of Lawrence who were attacked by this disease, they owe their lives to the men and women who were able to overcome this dangerous contact. <laughs>